Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, we meet Jennifer Karen, the newest addition to the 21 Hats Podcast team. Jennifer's business, SB Expos and Events, is an event management business that survived the shutdown in 2020 and has grown to more than $3 million a year in revenue. When COVID first hit, Jennifer tells Jay Goltz, she really thought it would put her out of business. In the end, she says, it made her stronger. Even so, she's very much stuck working in her business while looking for ways to extract herself from day-to-day tasks someone else could handle. But how do you free yourself up enough so that you have the time to put the people and systems in place that you know you need? And how long should that take? I hate to tell you, says Jay, it took me 10 years, but I'm going to help you here, so it's going to take you 10 months. Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations, brought to you by our principal sponsor, The Great Game of Business, will let owners know they are not alone in facing challenges. Same thing with our daily newsletter, The 21 Hats Morning Report, which Inc. Magazine named the best newsletter for business owners and which you can subscribe to for free at 21hats.com, where you can also find transcripts of our podcast episodes and lots of other articles and interviews. Joining me this week on the podcast are regulars Jay Goltz, who's CEO of The Goltz Group, whose companies in Chicago include a picture frame business, artist frame service, and a home furnishing store, Jason Home, and Jennifer Karen, who is CEO of SB Expos and Events, an events management business based near Baltimore, Maryland. The episode is titled, 12 hours a day, six days a week. Welcome, Jay, and especially Jennifer. It's great to have you here for your very first 21 Hats podcast. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be here. So uh, to get started, tell us about SB Expos and Events. What do you guys do? Sure. We are a uh, comprehensive trade show sales and convention management company for associations. We only work with associations on their, uh, on their conventions and trade shows. Give us a little more idea of what exactly you you do for them. What does event management mean for you? Sure. And how do you get paid? Yep, absolutely. And and that was my basic elevator speech in 10 seconds or less. So I'll explain a little bit more. Thank you. So probably all of your listeners have been to a convention or trade show sometime, right? And there's all sorts of ones out there. The ones that we work with are run by associations, either professional membership or trade associations, where they have a trade show or convention throughout the year. The difference for your listeners, a trade show is predominantly where there's an exhibit hall and not much education. A convention is a combination. So when you go to a conference where there's a combination of education, keynote speakers, breakouts, concurrence workshops, things like that, with an exhibit hall, that's more of a convention. What we do is comprehensive services. So we started off, um, the company has been around since 2009, but in the last couple of years, we've added a, a considerable amount of services. We started off just in the trade show world. We do exhibit and sponsorship sales and management. So an association outsources that to us. We contact companies, research companies um, who might be interested in exhibiting or sponsoring at their meeting. When COVID hit, you know, the events industry did just an amazing job during COVID, right? We were shut down. I remember that. Yes, 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 yes. We honestly, I thought we were going to go out of business. Because at the time, we had been working on an event tech platform. The events industry started, I would say 10 years ago, but really five years, we're really getting into event technology. We were already in it and we switched very quickly to doing virtual conventions and trade shows. Because of that, you know, they, they often say adversity can make you stronger. Out of that became what I saw a need in the market for not just our trade show sales manager, the add-on additional services. So now we do wraparound. We do registration. So when you go registering to get your badge, we handle that. We do speaker management. So should this um, event be in Nashville or should it be in Omaha or should it be in Seattle? We'll do site selection. We do all meetings management, logistics, food and beverage session where they should be, the event schedule, handling all of that. Um, hotel room block management, how many people are supposed to stay in this hotel, how many versus that hotel. We do something called lead retrieval. So uh, any of you, all the listeners I'm sure have been into where you've ha- taken your badge and you've walked into the exhibit hall and an exhibitor wants to scan your badge, right? That's called lead retrieval. We handle that. And then we handle, which came, all of these came out of the adversity we faced during COVID. 
we also handle um, event tech consulting. So associations can hire us to figure out how to take their event management and simplify it through technology. Can you give us an example of that? What does that mean? So imagine, um, I heard this phrase years ago that Excel spreadsheets are the duct tape for meeting planners. And that Excel spreadsheets are wonderful, but they're not databases. And we work with a specific technology platform. So if you have, some of our shows have 350 exhibitors and all of those exhibitors need to upload their logo and they need to um, figure out a certificate of insurance. They need to fill that out. They need to pay. They need to fill in their description. That's not done by Google Forms or Excel spreadsheet anymore. It's by a specific technology platform that we work on. That's a whole other story that I can get into, but we picked one. And so now we, um, we, we only work on one event technology platform because we've become experts on it. It's called the Cadmium Event Tech Platform. But that way, you don't use Excel spreadsheets. You don't use a Google form. It's a, a database or speakers. Let's say you have 250 speakers. Speakers have to upload their bio. They have to upload their credentials. They have to give us their demands for honorarium or if it's being free, what they're, what they're speaking about. Sometimes they have slides. Oftentimes, we have to get financial disclosures. Depending on the type of meeting that is being run, we, we have a big department that handles medical association meetings, which has a whole list of regulations that the government's been involved on and different accrediting uh, organizations have been involved in. Speakers have to fill out financial disclosure forms so that you know if that speaker is being paid by a pharmaceutical company or a medical device company. So managing speakers, again, you could do it in an Excel spreadsheet, but we don't want to work in duct tape anymore. We want to work in 21st century technology. And so we've moved out of that realm and moved into the next level of managing an event. Simplify it so that associations can think about sort of the next generation of experiences for their attendance and not worry about the considerable amount of administrative work that goes into it. Can you give us a sense of how big the business is? Sure. So we um, are, I think we're going to do 3.4 million this year. We were on track from a budget to do 3.2. We managed to get some additional sales in. So I'm looking at about 3.38, I think right now. I will say my Vistage group, I'm a manager of Vistage, will be super happy that I can say that metric off the top of my head. <laughs> when I started, I wasn't the best at that. So I've gotten better. No CEO knows everything as obviously the name of the 21 hats. One of my hats that I did not like to put on was the financial metrics. I'm going to give myself a little pat on the back that I, I can Good say that you. out loud. Yeah. And how many employees do you have? We have two starting this week. So full-time equivalents, I'm going to say 26. I think we have 30 full-time employees right now, but we have several part-time. One of the things that's interesting, again, at the beginning of COVID, I thought, I thought this company is going to be out of business soon. And yet it made us stronger. One of the other ways it made us stronger besides the technology was we went to a fully virtual company. We no longer have an office. We used to. And I was two weeks away from buying a building. We were supposed to settle March 22nd. Oh, you're breaking Jay's heart. <laughs> no, she might be breaking her own heart long term. So not my heart. I, I wonder long term whether you're not going to look back and go, oops, I should have bought the building. Not sure yet. Well, we'll see. Jury's still out. Jury's still yeah. out. We'll see. We, um, we were supposed to buy it March 22nd. And I walked away from that because of COVID. And then what I decided is to go a fully virtual office. So now we're in 12 different states. So the two people that started on Monday are in two different states. I'm based in Maryland, but they're based in other states. So we'll see, Jay. Um, we, we'll see. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm just saying, I think when you've got a lot of new employees, I have a hard time figuring out how you're going to train and, and develop things. And I, so not just for you, for lots of other companies in America, I think that it's still early in the game to figure out long term whether that's going to work. I will tell you every single thing you say because I'm heavily involved with the framing industry and I totally get everything you're talking about. It makes perfect sense to me because I, I'm out there on the, you know, involved with it. Let me ask you an interesting question. I think we figured out in the framing industry, only 15% of picture framers go to the national trade show. What do you think it is in a lot of other industries? That's, yeah, it's a, a strange statistic because sometimes I've seen with really smaller associations, they're getting 25 to 35% of attendance based on membership, a percentage of membership. Membership, but those are small associations. 
the really big associations where you have a lot of members, they don't get a high percentage. So I don't think that that's that bad, Jay. What I found is that associations will then come up with other types of meetings to try to get other groups. So for yours, maybe are there other like what they call in the association where like special interest groups? Do you have other smaller conferences? No, our problem is that the industry has shrunk considerably since the heyday because it's a whole story, but a lot of it is just the baby boomers are getting out of framing and their kids aren't framing pictures like they used to. So, and then there's big chain stores now that have eaten up a lot of the market. So the, sure. the custom framing industry for retail picture framers that own their own store clearly is down by, by probably half, but still healthy, still enough business around. But the part that I find interesting is whatever industry, the ones you just talked about, the one I'm in, it blows my mind that people would not go to a national trade show for the industry they're in. And I just don't think it's smart. I think the fact that only whatever the number, 15, 20, 25, 30, it's hard for me to imagine how you could be in an industry and go to a trade show or a convention and not leave there with enough value that it paid for itself 10 times over. And that I, that's just surprising. I, I think the average person might think, oh, a national convention, I'm sure 80% of the people go. And that's simply not the case. No. It, and, and I agree. I am surprised that um, if you're joining now, if let's say your dues are $225, right, to the association, how you haven't figured out that the return on the investment of going to the annual meeting is worth it. I think um, the the smartest associations have figured out that ROI and how to convince their members, but it is a problem across the board for all trade shows. You know, um, a member doesn't mind writing a check for $225. And to be honest, sometimes it's not even budget. Sometimes it's just time out of the office. They're like, ah, do I really want to go? It's going to be three days. No, I'm right. No, I'm too busy to go. Yes. I I mean, it doesn't make any, but that's the nature of small business. That is interesting because in our industry, there's no big accreditation. So they, you know, the question becomes, this is absolutely a chicken and egg. Yeah. The people don't go say, I can't afford it. And my argument is, can you afford not to go? And do the people that go there, go there because it pays for itself? Or is, is it the fact that the people that don't go to it can't afford it? It's like, it, it's, it's self-defeating. I mean, they need, I think people need to go. Not that needs the right word. If you want to grow your business, I believe going to a convention or a trade show is clearly worth the time commitment, even if you've got to close the business for a day or two. Because, Jay, you're going to see how other people are running their businesses? Is that the idea? No, three reasons. A, there's vendors there. You might find a vendor that no one else knows about. And you're, I mean, there's, it's, it's hard to cover the country with reps. There's new vendors that come up that don't necessarily have rep coverage around the country. A, B, the classes, you could find one insight from one class that just can change your whole world. And three, you could be standing in line getting lunch and start talking to the person next to you and get some tremendous insight from someone else who's not in your market. That's the key to this. You can finally let your hair down and have an honest conversation with somebody that's across the country that you wouldn't want to have with somebody whose business is two miles from yours. So it's just, like I said, I can't imagine how this doesn't pay for itself 10 times over. All right. You've written enough ad copy for Jennifer J. (laughs) Well, and that's just one side, right? That's like if you're a business and you're going to a trade association to learn about your business, but imagine a small business where their clients are at right? Um, Whether they decide to exhibit or not, if all of their clients or many of their clients go to a specific trade show, they should be there, right? Besides them going to learn about what they should do better in their company, learning what the clients are doing, what are the trends that their clients are seeing? What does the future look like for their clients? The only way they're going to have all of their clients in one room, possibly, is at a convention or trade show, right? And so, Every small business out there should look at their top 10 clients and what trade shows they go to and figure out how to go to at least one of them every year. I can also tell you, I got a couple of cronies that I've been friends with for 30, 40 years that I get tremendous insights from them. One comment to me 30 years ago, oh, you should go to this trade show. It, it changed my business and that I started importing molding and stuff. So it could be just one comment from one person you developed a relationship with over the years that you would have never had exposure to that person if you don't go to the convention or the trade show. So I've been to hundreds of them over the years, literally. We saw this in Chicago. Uh, Jay and I met you, Jennifer, at the, uh, the first 21 Hats in-person event. 
And I know you, you talked to people uh, around the room and some of them really, it seemed, hadn't given a whole lot of thought to whether there even was an association for their industry. Yeah, absolutely. Longtime listener. And so when Lauren decided to have this meeting, I was one of the first people to email him and, and, and ask how to sign up because I, I know the value of meeting face-to-face in, in that kind of environment. And I just wanted to meet other business owners. I was sitting next to Steve Curl and we were talking about um, different trade associations. And so I started, he's like, I, I don't think I'm a member of that many. And we typed in one and he was like, well, that's not the quite fit. And then we found another one. He's like, whoa. And we looked at the board of directors and it was a lot of his competitors. And so he's like, absolutely, I need to be a part of this. Um, I'm hoping I'm not throwing him under the bus a little bit. <laughs> I think you're giving him some good publicity. Uh, so Steve joined. Uh, I talked to him. I emailed him afterwards, and I was like, "So did you join?" He's like, "Yeah." It was a um, a trade association that was perfectly. It was a niche one, but perfectly fit for his type of of uh, company. Digital marketing. Yeah, digital and a very specific type of digital marketing. So he he was thrilled to see it. I think people sometimes think that trade associations are sort of very early 20th century. But if they look, a new trade association seems to be born once a week, right? Because the, really? the world of commerce and trade is changing so fast. There weren't any um, artificial intelligence associations, I'm sure, 20 years ago. I'm sure I could probably find <laughs> 10 right now, right? So I think for every business owner out there, they should find the trade association that fits for their company and find the ones that are good for their clients. With that being said, many of them, you know better than me, are struggling terribly. The associations? Yeah, there's there's lots of trade so Listen, the, the picture frame, we even had a picture framing trade show for two or three years because of COVID and like it's getting started up again in February. But I know of other, they, they've had, a, COVID was brutal to them and um, it's it's been a problem. So while there's some new ones coming along, you tell us, some of them have dropped out. Yes, no, have some just gone out of business? I think it just depends on the industry, Jay. I, I haven't seen that across the board. We work with a wide variety of associations, and I think it depends on what's happening with the industry. There are some associations that are growing gangbusters and even grow dramatically through COVID. Think about the industries that did really well in COVID. There were quite a few. Those associations did well too. I think the bigger question, if you look at which ones are struggling, is how much of their budget depends on the event or how much depends on dues. Right. If it depends on the event, then sure, COVID was rough in our industry, really rough. Do you have competition, Jennifer? I do. <laughs> I would say, um, honestly, there's other third-party companies out there like us, but the majority of our competition is more staff for our associations. It's, um, does the association want to outsource this to a third party or do they want to hire staff to do it internally? That's usually, I mean, I, there's other competitors out there, but I feel like lots of times I compete with the concept of hiring staff to do it. You, you know, you described a, a broad range of services that you offer and how those services, uh, those offerings expanded uh, after COVID. As you were describing them, it occurred to me that, that each one of those represents a pricing decision. It seemed pretty complicated. How do you approach that? So I vastly underestimated the level of complexity that I walked myself into <laughs> when I decided to add these services. Uh, yeah, Lauren, you're absolutely right. Uh, about two years ago, I decided to add all these other services. I understood the concept of them. I had been part of the events industry for 25 years, knew the different vendors that were out there, the different ways it was done. But underestimate it, we operate on a scope of work based on um, a fee-based service. So for the whole year, if you want to do registration for 5,000 people, it's going to cost X amount of dollars. It's usually a 12-month um, planning cycle. And that's what you pay us um, based on the scope of work, which makes it a little bit easier for cash flow. It definitely makes it a little bit easier for invoicing, but vastly underestimates how much time you have to spend to really define the scope of work. And you need people who really understand it to make sure the scope of work is done. So I've been learning a lot. There's a couple other ways we do fees that we're playing with. Um, hotel commissions is part of it. Lead retrieval fees is another part of it. Hourly tech support's another one. But I am working a lot of hours to figure that part out. <laughs> 
I got to tell you, I went through the exact same thing with every one of my businesses because I didn't understand the business model, quote unquote. Like when I went to the wholesale side, I didn't know the volume and paying sales reps. So I've been through the whole thing with trying to figure out what you got to charge and what the expenses are. So you're, you're, I won't even say you're reinventing the wheel because in some ways you're probably are inventing the wheel. You're coming up with a whole new thing to some degree. So that's normal. And you are going to figure it out. And as soon as you figure it out, life gets easier because then you start charging properly. And then all of a sudden you can afford better staff and life gets easier. Jay, how long do you think that took? I'm still in the midst of it. (laughs) Well, I, it depends which, I hate to tell you, it took me 10 years, but I'm going to help you here. So it's going to take you 10 months. So that's the payback from I'm at the 18 month mark and uh, I I feel like I I had no one to talk to. I'm telling you, I had no one to talk to. And my framing business got so much bigger than anybody else's. It's not like I could go find someone to talk to about what do you do with a million dollar a year frame shop or I just, and I had to figure it out. And I, you know, it took took, took a while. In your case, you're going to figure it out much quicker. Jennifer, you you talked in Chicago a little bit about your your struggle with the hours uh, a day that you're working and the number of days a, a, a week. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Why are you personally putting in such long hours and how are you hoping to address that? Sure. I think I mentioned um, in Chicago that I was working about six days a week, 12-hour days since COVID. I would say before COVID, end of 2019, our company was just trade show sales and management. We were a staff of, I think January 2020, I was a staff of nine. And um, we had our workflow and our processes on our invoicing. We'd have everything down very, very good. At that point, I was training leadership and I wasn't working as hard. COVID hit. Obviously, I had to put all hands on deck to try to get us through it. When I decided to add the services, I didn't realize it was exponentially more difficult. To Jay's point, I'm inventing the wheel. For some of these other services we offer, I know what to do. I've hired good staff, but you can't expect staff to create your financial structure of how to do invoicing and deal with cash flow because that service has a different way to collect fees, right? You can't expect staff to figure out how to create the structure of the department of hey, we have a director, manager, coordinator, and how often we're going to meet, things like that. You have to sort of put it in place and hire the people to do it. And I was hiring people so fast that I didn't think through the structure of each department, which is based on the service line, or how they talk to each other. How does the director of registration talk to the director of meeting planning? And what are the transitions of work between the, and the handoffs? I I vastly underestimated this. So I am working... <laughs> Especially in a remote environment, right? Has that been a challenge? Uh, remote's not. It's funny because I was not on board with hybrid work. I was the first CEO to say, no, you have to be in the office. You can't work at home one day a week. And then I get fully virtual. So I've done a, a 180 on that. Because we're in the events industry and because we meet on show sites so often... We can have dinners. We can um, be a part of it. We see each other. I see our employees a couple times every year. It doesn't seem to be as difficult. But I also know that if you're a coordinator and you're right out of college and you're not quite sure what to do, it's much harder than I had anticipated than sitting next to somebody at a desk and figuring out how to work. So in that case, yeah, I I agree with you, Lauren. It's, It's harder. I would say the key part to this is, and I fully accept you're going around the country so you do see them. So that certainly helps. The key part to this is hiring staff to, I, I, you know, I talk to people, oh, I'm, I want to hire someone to do what I do so I can just go out and sell. And I call, you know what they call those people? They're called entrepreneurs. They don't need you. <laughs> so um, I think in your case and everyone else's case at your stage, you have to find three very capable people. And I used to always hear CEOs go, oh, I hire people smarter than myself. And I used to laugh. It's true. People that are better than you at the financial piece, the marketing piece, the management piece. And those people exist. And you're just going through the learning curve now of figuring out what you need and finding them. But you will figure it out. What makes us successful is the same thing that drags us down, torturing ourselves. We're really good at torturing ourselves. You said, I didn't think it through. That really isn't the case. You just didn't know. I mean, you could have thought it through all you wanted. You haven't been in this situation. Some of this is simply the learning curve. There was nothing to think through. So 
I hope today I can give you the gift of stop torturing yourself. You're doing extremely well. Thanks for the pep talk. <laughs> no, I mean it. You're not, no one's going to come into a situation like yours and figure it all out on the front end. That's just, that's just not how it works. So you will figure it out. You need three key people and I don't think you have them at this stage. I think I have one and I'm trying to train the others. And then I have a fractional CFO who has said to me for the past year, Jen, you really need some an internal, you, you need an internal, I don't know if it's a controller. Right. Because I do all the bookkeeping and the invoicing. Okay. That's, okay, that's crazy. <laughs> so yes, you clearly need that person and they will pay for themselves. You're not a $800,000 a year business. So it's your stage. How do you mean they'll pay for themselves? They're not, they're not going to drive revenue, but you mean by freeing no, Jennifer up? they're going to free her up and they're going right. to catch stuff that she's not an accountant. They're, they're going to they're gonna have some skill set to be able to do stuff she's not used to doing. There's a good example of hiring someone that's better at something than you are. You're not an accountant. So you clearly need the financial person in mm-hmm. your stage. So the part that would be harder is if you told me you were doing a million too. That's a problem. You can't truly... It's hard to get the math to work to go hire a financial person for a million to business, but you're big enough now. That shouldn't be a problem. So you get the financial person, the person to to do the the marketing slash sales, perhaps, and then the operations. And then you do the entrepreneur stuff, which is spending a lot of time on 21 hats and talking to Lauren and I. (laughs) Well, that's the part, you know, (laughs) the oversight is your... Wearing so many hats at a million dollars. Yeah. And as you grow, you're trying to take them the hats and put them on other people, right? The financial side, at a million dollars, I could send out our monthly invoices and, and manage it. Sure. To give you an example, we travel a lot. So our Amex bill is pretty high, but it's also a lot of transactions. So before, after every show, I would have to go into QuickBooks and and manually do the transactions for all of the Amex once and put them in the proper GL code. Well, now every Sunday, I'm spending four to six hours doing stupid $5 and 15 cents and Dunkin' Donuts at the airport and putting that in the GL code. Ouch. Like, I'm like, how did I miss that this needs to get off my plate? <laughs> no, that's, I can tell you because I live in that world. That's a $50,000 a year job. Oh God, I'd pay it tomorrow. <laughs> no, that's what, that's what you pay people. That's called a payable person for $50,000 probably in whatever market. You get a very competent person that's very good at, at it and is totally into it and does a good job and totally take it off your, your hands. I think that's what I'm going to post the job tomorrow because I would like my Sunday nights back. <laughs> yeah. Jennifer, let me ask you this. You mentioned that you went through a period where you were hiring very fast. Did that go well for you? Overall, pretty good. We started hiring uh, last year. So January of 2022, I started with 11 staff and now we're at 30. So we've hired, you know. 28. No, maybe we started at 14. I, we've hired 20 people in the past year and uh, two of them didn't work out. So the rest of them did. Last year, if everybody remembers the summer of the great labor migration, I think you had a separate podcast uh, panelist who sort of predicted this. Uh, we yes. saw it. William. Yeah, we saw it a lot. Everybody saw it, right? Last summer. Because the virtual, you could work from home, the remote aspect, we were able to get better employees than I would have expected because they they valued the stay at home, the remote work, and they we could hire in different states. So overall, um, I think what the hiring part was okay, the training. I mean, to Jay's point, when you're remote, you have to have a more established training program than when you're in person. And that's another thing I underestimated. And now we have a better training program. The first week, they just stay with our, um, we have a uh, office manager who spends the first week with them just introducing their systems. They don't even meet the rest of us except for one full staff call. Just taking that off of our individual director's plates has been dramatic. So overall, I've got a lot to learn about training. Hiring, I felt like, okay. But I'll tell you another thing that I need to get off my plate. Boy, oh boy, state tax, like, when, when you hire a new employee in, and they're, let's say, in Nebraska, holy moly, if I could find a company that could say, look, I'll set up your, your company in Nebraska and I'll figure out the, the code to give ADP. Wait, 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 wait. wait. That company are exists. Using, yeah. Are you not using an outside payroll service? I use ADP. ADP won't do this. I still have to. Okay, you need to get away from ADP. There's, there's 10 other companies out there that, that the ADP was 
for gigantic companies, and and I was with them years ago. There are companies, as Lauren just said, this already exists. For it does. Sure. Oh so, my gosh! Do you know how much time I was yes. on the phone? Yeah, I do know because I've got several people to work out of state. Oh, I, I absolutely it's know. Crazy of like, hey Tennessee, could you please send me the unemployment insurance number so I can take it out? Or no, I get the mail and I see. Oh, there's a mail from Colorado. I got somebody in Colorado. I got somebody in Oregon. I, I, yeah, I know. And like, there's something that you should be putting zero time into because there's companies that do that. Jay, send me those companies. Again, that's going to hire tomorrow. You can Google it. This is a very common problem. Oh my gosh. There are a lot of services. (laughs) Is it? Absolutely. And this is a problem with growth, right? You just miss things. You miss the things that you can take off of your plate. That's all. The fact of the matter is your biggest problem, as mine was, you are by yourself. I got this theory, and it usually pays off, that one human being can run about a $3 million business by themselves. Now, match that with a husband, wife, match that with a father, son, mother, daughter, whatever. Now, all of a sudden, you see some of these companies are doing, there's three siblings working together. You're by yourself. Mm -hmm. With that being said, I have people working for me now that is every bit, if not more competent than a relative would be. I mean, it's not a matter of trusting them. They're totally trustworthy, but you just haven't found those people yet. Maybe you found one, you said. Once you find those three people, life gets very much, 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 much simpler. But a lot of these companies have enough family in there that they can handy. They basically can get away with it because they've got enough family there to cover it. Well, let me ask you this, Jake, because I have three other, um, I think, burgeoning leaders. They're getting there. They're new, right? They, they've been hired in the last six, eight months. And, and one of the things I always hear is that a business owner needs to spend at this point a lot of time and, and investment on training the next level of leaders. So I have one that has a skill set, but I have three to five who I think are the next generation of leaders. Like they're, they're strong and I just need to get them leadership development. Would you agree with that? Uh, to, to, here's, here's an interesting twist. You keep calling them leaders. There's a difference between management and leadership. Ah. At this stage, you're the leader. You're not that big that you need a bunch of leaders. At my on my level with 130 people, I absolutely need leaders and I have them. It's your stage. First start with getting a management and then they become leaders. But, got it. But That's right. People use that phrase all the time. Oh, I've got my leadership team. I go, what are you talking about a leadership team? They're not leaders. They're, they're managers. So That's Perfect. Yes. People do. Yeah. And I will also tell you, this is the biggest problem in entrepreneurship. We figure stuff out. That's why we're successful. If we didn't figure it out, we wouldn't be around. You wouldn't be on here today. If you didn't figure it out, you'd still be running a $600,000 business. We figure stuff out. Everyone else doesn't figure it out. They need to be trained. And once they're trained, they're just as valuable as we would be. We have to understand stuff that we figure out that people, oh, well, that's common sense. No, it's not common sense. That's the point. It isn't common sense. For whatever reason, we figure stuff out and other people who, especially if they're younger, we can save them. Maybe they would figure it out too 15 years from now. We can take someone who's 30 and get them to be as smart as a 50-year-old within a year or two. Um, You and I are out there trying to figure it out on our own and it takes a long time. Oh, that's so timely, Jay, because I think that's yet another mistake I made in the past sort of two years is that I thought if I hired people with good skill set that they could create and solve those problems and create that structure. And to your point, I've realized once I set it up, they're amazing. Right. Right. Yeah. But uh, I expected, I think, just too much of them to do it. And, and the reason you expected this because you figured it out. So you think I, everyone that's else. That's exactly it. Right. That's <laughs> why I'm saying you're an entrepreneur. They're not. It's just different. And I, like I said, I've got key people here that are way better at stuff that, hey, they correct me plenty of times. I'll have a meeting. Jay, we shouldn't do that. Here's a, yeah, you're right. They're extremely smart and insightful. They've also been here for 20 years. You know, you don't have 20 years to get this straightened out. So I'm, I'm hoping that I can help you. Listen, I wish I could have gotten my own advice 30 years ago. Oh, my <laughs> God. I would be, my business would be twice the size or three or twice as profitable. I just... The world's changed. There was no one to talk to for me 20. Well, I didn't try that hard, but I did try. So we're running short on time here. But before we go, Jay, I want to I want to check in on your business a little bit. You, you've talked here uh, about having inventory coming out of your ears. I think the last time we talked about it on the podcast, you told us that you were still out there buying stuff, even though you were storing it all over Chicago. Yes. But you were still buying because that's what your home store does. You need the current stuff. 
Uh, have you made any progress with that? Where do you stand? Well, I'll tell you, having my son here, who I've made him the chief uh, profitability officer, he rides me like a typical employee wouldn't because he's my kid and he's not wrong. And he'll go, dad, look at the inventory we have. And it made me sit down and do the math. And I showed it to him. The fact of the matter is my business is big enough now that I figured out we're going to use up X amount of, you know, of cost of goods sold. And that by the end of the year, if half of what we sell, for instance, in the home store. Okay, but you told us that six months ago. Have you made progress? No, no, for sure. For sure. I mean, the fact of the matter is my business is a little seasonal. The first half isn't as as busy as the second half. My point is, ask me December 31st. I think I'm going to tell you we're in good (laughs) shape. I'm going to ask you before that. (laughs) If whatever I sell, half it comes out of inventory, we're good. So I think that's where we're at. It also illustrates on the entrepreneurial level, you better have lines of credit. Thank you for mentioning that because I think we we haven't really covered the, what what this does to the economics of your business and why having too much inventory can be the financial problem that it, that it presents. Can you walk us through the accounting of that a little bit and how it can get you into a cash crunch? Because buying stuff is very easy. I literally send people around the world to find cool and interesting stuff and 20 years ago, I might have knee jerked and said, stop buying stuff. Well, you know what? That doesn't work because my customer's Jason home is based upon having cool and interesting stuff. And I can't just shut off the spigot on top of which the collateral damage from that to tell your people who are totally into the mission to tell them stop doing your job for a few months is not a good thing. So the math of it is I literally have millions of dollars of too much inventory, but I'm going to go through it by the end of the year. But you mentioned the lines of credit and how important they are. Why do you need lines of credit? Because I'm buying inventory the first half of the year or the first five months of the year, I lose money just because of seasonality. So that uses up cash. And then it's very easy to buy a million dollars worth of stuff. You go to a few trade shows, you go to some things, and all of a sudden your inventory goes up and it's coming right out of your cash. And in some businesses, it depends what business you're in, what sucks up cash, inventory, receivables could be a killer. In my case, not terrible because a lot of my stuff is, you know, I, you know, you buy it and you pay for it right away. And in some businesses, it's buying expensive machinery, which you should be able to lease. So that shouldn't be a problem. But inventory kills a lot of companies. But, but there's a difference there, right? Like if you had bought equipment last year, you would have been able to deduct that. Yes. A lot of people don't understand. Inventory is not a tax deduction. You just, instead of having cash, you've got inventory. It's, it's, you can't deduct the cost of inventory. So it doesn't even help you tax-wise at the end of the year. Now, in some cases, you want to get rid of inventory that's not selling because you can then take the loss and it does help your tax bill. But the key thing there is that y- y- if you bought the inventory last year, you can't write it off until you actually sell it. Exactly. And the issue for me versus if you've been reading about Target's got all this problem with too much inventory. I'm not in the fashion business. Our stuff doesn't have a shelf life like, oh my God, last season this was hot and now this. So so I'm not running the risk much of getting stuck with stuff, whereas some companies, they got in trouble. I mean, they bought too much inventory and now they got to dump it because the fashion's changed so quick. Jennifer, are you glad this is one problem you don't have? (laughs) I was thinking the same thing as inventory is not a problem I have. And considering the financial part, maybe not my specialty, I'm happy I don't have My thanks to Jay Galtz and Jennifer Karen, and of course, to our sponsor, The Great Game of Business, which helps businesses use an open book management system to build healthier companies. You can learn more at greatgame.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Wait, wait, don't leave yet. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like the 21 Hats owners to address, send it to me by replying to your morning report or by email at lauren at 21hats.com. That's L-O-R-E-N at 21hats.com. Do it now before you forget. And don't be afraid to tell Jay what you really think. He can take it. And if you got something out of this conversation, help us reach more business owners. Tell a friend. Subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to The Morning Report at 21hats.com. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Okay, now you can leave. Thanks for listening, everyone.